okay, I am fed up of starting my sermons this way, but you're just going to have to put up with it. I've been given one of my favorite passages of scripture to preach on. How cool is that? And I know I must have quite a lot of favourite passages of scripture because whenever I get to preach, it's another favourite. How cool, how amazing my God is. OK, so I'm going to read the scripture first. And if you listen to nothing else this morning, listen to this. Yeah. So just receive what the Holy Spirit says to you. As beautiful Nikki said earlier, the word of God is living and active sharper than a double-edged sword it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit yeah it goes right into us flesh from body yeah so just let the word speak to your spirit and then i'll try to bring some good stuff out of it as well but god's holy spirit can speak to all of us guys without without me adding much now there was a pharisee a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, because no one could perform the signs you're doing if God wasn't with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can even see the kingdom of God not the kingdom of God, that's my emphasis, mm -hmm. unless they are born again. <clears throat> huh? said Nicodemus, that's not on the text. How can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You shouldn't be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be, said Nicodemus. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you don't understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify about what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How then will you believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only one son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Okie dokie. So that's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> Talk about being given a purple passage to preach on. I'm not actually going to take the obvious bit at the end. It's so magnificent. It's so awesome. But it's not what God has given me to preach today. But suffice to say, if Christians through the ages had focused on verse 17, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him if the church whatever the church is had taken that message to heart the church would look completely different today and church history would have been this living beating throbbing heart 
the most amazing phrase Tim came up with, oh golly, can we have a godly gloat again about Tim's sermon last week? God is the ultimate includer, he said. Wasn't that a fantastic quote? He's the ultimate includer. And in our brokenness, human beings have taken the gospel of good news for all mankind that God wants to invite everybody in who wants to share in his promise, who will be humble enough to bow the knee to Jesus. We've turned that message into something exclusive, in, out. You don't belong, you're not part of us. God is the ultimate includer. The Bible says that God wants everyone to be saved and to come to know him. And that's got to be our heart as we aim our lives to beat with his heart. People, that's got to be what it looks like in this river that we're flowing in. It's got to come out like that. It's got to smell like that, taste like that, feel like that, if we want it to taste, feel, and smell like Jesus. Okay, so that's not my sermon. But that's just my thought <laughs> as I get going. Now, because I'm having the privilege of, of, of preaching in a sequence of sermons, I want to emphasize our end point. We're not going as far into the book of John as this, but John 20 verse 31 says, everything that's been written in this book is these things. There's a lot more that I could have written than the author says, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He really was the son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Okay, so that's what all of what we're talking about in the next few weeks. And what all we've been talking about in the last few weeks is about that you will have enough equipment inside you to actually make an informed choice to say, yes, I'm believing Jesus is the son of God. But the second bit is just as important. By believing that, I'm going to have life in his name full life, healed up life, whole life, so that the very things that come up against us to trip us up are going to be the things that make us whole <laughs> as we buy into his resurrection glory. So don't be depressed or downhearted if you're having a rubbish hard time. I've had a tough week. I'm not going into the details of it, but I've had a horribly tough week in some areas. Yeah. And just when I thought it was over, ah, Something came and bit me on the bottom, yeah? It is irrelevant. It's just, it is irrelevant. As we press into Jesus, every stumbling bone, every stumbling rock, what do you call it? A stumbling yeah. stone, block. stumbling block. block. Yeah, that's the word. thank you, sorry. Every stumbling block becomes a stepping stone, yeah? The things that the enemy sends us, yes, yes, that's me, definitely sends to get us down become something that we put under our feet because Jesus put it under us. Okay, so now I really will start to preach. <laughs> that would be a good idea, won't it? Okay. Oh, another gem from, yeah, from Tim last week. I just can't keep, can't stop mentioning these amazing highlights. We carry the Holy of Holies inside of us. Ha! Ah, how good is that? The whole of the Old Testament was leading up to this idea that God was awesome and separate and different, and you could only approach him once a year if you needed to know how holy he was. Whole curtain torn apart. Now we have the Holy of Holies, literally the Holy Spirit inside us. That's what the lady encountered through me while she was doing the pedicure, and she was just drawn to it because the Holy of Holies in me, the God who is not just perfect and pure, and needs to be separate because he's is so good that he's dealt with sin and comes out to reach her and give her a great big COVID free hug. That's what she was leading into. She hadn't felt anything like that before except at her auntie's funeral and she wanted to know what it was all about. So the line that I am focusing on from this amazing passage where you could have sermon after sermon after sermon just on the first 18 verses of chapter three of on and you would be full of treasure if you just focused on this but I have actually really been told to focus on verse 8 so I'm going to read it to you the wind blows wherever it wants wherever it pleases you hear its sound but you cannot quite tell where it comes from or where it's going so it is with everyone born of the spirit 
So he uses a natural analogy because Nicodemus's mind is used to understanding things in the material world. And he says, you know, the things of God are a bit like a blowing wind. And that cooks Nicodemus's goose because the religious spirit always wants to control. Yeah, that's just a quick free tidbit. It just loves controlling things, ordering things, organizing things. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for forward planning. I just can't do it anymore. But, you know, it's a really important thing. Providing we always forward plan with Jesus. There's nothing wrong with planning a sermon. You don't have to just get it as you walk up the steps. Yeah, you can plan, you can think ahead. It's important to use our rational. Providing we don't try to control God. (laughs) Because you know what? God really knows the best for us. He gave us the tree of life in the garden. (laughs) We just didn't notice it because we wanted to go and eat the tree of knowledge and sort ourselves out. And look where that got us. Can't help delivering that one like a bit like it was a line from Roland Hardy. Mm -mm, Not good, yeah? But he always wanted us to taste the delicious tree of life. It just happens now as we trust him. So sometimes, brothers and sisters, we just have to let go of control completely and let God move in our spirits like a wind blowing in our sails. It's deep what I'm encouraging us. It's not just, I'm not just saying you can't always have your own way, but I'm saying at a very deep level, you know what, sometimes you can't have your own way. If you submit to Jesus, you do genuinely say, Okay, just like he did in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, yours. You take over. You're in the driving seat now. My life is to be your vessel, Lord. That's what I'm all about. That's what what I'm doing with my life. Okay, so that was my cri de coeur, my cry of the heart, my call to arms for all of us. The spirit, you hear it sound, but you can't always tell where it comes from or where it's going. You just know when a fresh wind moves by, whoa, that has changed everything. That has changed everything. And I'm going to ask you, men and women of God and any young people who are listening, are you going to let him do that in your life? It is so scary. I can't get my voice any higher, or I would say, but it is so good. I don't think it ever stops being scary because we like to organize things and have things on our own terms. We all do. But the more we let go and let God, the more he literally gods it through our lives. And that looks purposeful and powerful. And life gets better and better. And don't let anyone tell you it doesn't get better. It really, 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 really does. So I'm going to take a a five minute snapshot of the life of Nicodemus, just because I think it's interesting. I'm not going into any details, but he was a big wig in the religious system that was actually trying to control Jesus. So he turns up. I'm so sorry. I wasn't looking at the camera. I was so mesmerized by looking at Kath and Ed. And I just thought, oh, I love them so much. I started looking the wrong way because I was just looking at them, but I should start looking at the camera. Okay, so he turned up at night, but isn't it interesting what he said? He said, we know that you're sent by God. That meant it wasn't just him. (laughs) He was the one who yielded his heart and got soft. If you want to have a lovely portrayal of what happened with Nicodemus, I suspect that the narrative on um, YouTube called The Chosen will do it really, really well, because the first episode that featured him couldn't have been made better. A guy who had loyalties in both camps and who so deeply wanted the things of God that ultimately, ultimately he changes camps. But he does express here that actually the Sanhedrin, the big wigs, the Pharisees, they knew at what bottom that this guy was sent by God. The trouble is it means It meant to them that they had to jettison their control. They had to leave their authority over the Jewish people and be prepared to go with God. And they just, that was their tragedy. They couldn't do it. But Nicodemus came by night, so he was worried about being exposed. But he just knew in his Noah, there's something in this guy that I want. Now, what does it look like? 
few chapters later in John 7, verse 45, very interesting. They're having a good old beef in the Sanhedrin against Jesus. And dear Nicodemus pipes up, verse 45 to 51. Oh, is it really lawful to condemn a guy before you've even heard him speak, he says? And he gets jumped on. He gets jumped on. Are you one of his followers too? So I don't know what he made of that. I just love him. He comes out of the dark place into the slightly lighter place, yes? And says, hang on, we're doing the wrong thing. Is it really right for us just to do this when you haven't even heard the guy yourselves? Are you really sure about this? And he goes public and gets pilloried for it. Hmm. And then this is the most powerful bit. John 19, verse 39 and afterwards, he actually buries Jesus. He goes very public. He's one of the guys, in some church traditions, he's called one of the myrrh bringers who buries Jesus. He venerates him. He honors him. He doesn't care anymore <laughs> if he's known in public for being his follower. Even at that time when his follower meant that he looked like a great big failure. <laughs> Yeah, because it hadn't worked out well. He was there. He was there. He, he was there just before the resurrection, giving some sort of public acknowledgement to his faith that Jesus was the special one. I just love him. There's a really nice, this is just for interest, if you're interested in legends, there's an interesting legend that he went to live with Gamaliel, the teacher of Paul in Gamaliel's country house. I'm leaving that for you to explore in further detail later if you're avid readers of Wikipedia articles and that sort of thing. It's an early church tradition that the two of them got together in, um, um, uh, in a religious setting, but in away from Jerusalem and all the high pressure. You don't know what happened to them there, but I just like the idea of him ending up in the garden. That's my idea of heaven. Okay, back to my central line. Look at what it did to the trajectory of Nicodemus's life. He started with a cozy, official, prestigious life. He ended up being prepared to be associated with the no-hopers and people who were not part of the authority because he believed in Jesus. He starts off not understanding a thing, so much that Jesus has to go, huh, you don't get this? You can be a teacher in Israel and not get this basic stuff about the way the Holy Spirit works? Yes, now I was looking at Anne and Nigel. Sorry, I was mesmerized by Anne and Nigel. I wanted to look at them. Now, okay, keep looking at the camera. Good. Yeah. You cannot tell where the Holy Spirit comes from and where it is going. Now, I'm going to give some very concise teaching. I am actually, I felt very clearly to unpick a little sequence. It doesn't matter if you weren't there of what happened Last time we had a wider river meeting. We've just had our first one. If we've announced the date for the second one, people, write it in your diary. Those evening meetings are, in the deepest sense of the word, awesome. Because it is, it's not, it's not announced yet, that's fine. But when it is, get on it. Put it in your diary. Make it your top priority. Get someone else to put the kids to bed. Or get the kids to put themselves to bed. I am teasing, please, to pick up your kids. But what I'm saying is, um, make it a priority. We are hosting the presence of God here at Waycroft Hall and in River Church. And the hungry from the neighboring churches from other places in the Southwest are coming here because they're so hungry. And as a result, you've got a greater degree of the famished hungry than we can have on a Sunday morning at the moment. Do you see what I mean? It's because from we're blessing other churches with an encounter with God, and then these people go back to set light to their church. Do you understand? What happens in those meetings is, is regionally train, changing people, not just locally changing people, and I'm incredibly excited. So I'm going to unpick that. Now, I want to talk a bit about how the Holy Spirit has worked in the experience of myself and Vince, because we were doing this sort of stuff for years before we realized what we were doing. And I think sometimes it really helps people to have clear teaching. So you can say, oh, okay, I can trust this a little bit more. It's not just odd, it might have something in it. In 1993 and four, when the Holy Spirit rolled into Britain through what became known as the Toronto Blessing, I was all up for it, although I didn't get any of it, obviously, until I 
on an obvious level, I didn't get it until I'd given birth to my first baby. I was very preoccupied by the fact that the doctor said she probably wouldn't live. As you can probably imagine, I was very focused on her. I didn't know it was a little girl at the time. But at home, although he wasn't part of the ICTHIS leadership, that was the stream of churches that we were part of, Vince was praying strongly one morning and started praying in tongues. We'd already been filled with the Spirit and were released in the gift of tongues. That's another story. But he was praying in tongues when the Holy Spirit just fell on him. And he got what became known as the laughter for a couple of hours. It turned out that other people across London, at the same time, literally, the leadership of HDB, the leadership of, um, of our church and some other churches were trying to have meetings and the Holy Spirit fell on them all. They couldn't function as normal because God just got them laughing. Now, what is that all about? Can I say really clearly? I don't know. I really don't know what that's about, other than the fact that laughing is really good for us. And when we laugh, we relax. And the question we have to ask is not, is it good? Is it fruitful? Is it clever? Or does it achieve anything? It's simply, is it God? Now, if it's God, then it is good. <laughs> we can trust it. And the sense that was given to John Arnott, who was one of the leaders of the vineyard where this first broke out in Toronto, it became known as the Toronto Blessing, when he was saying, because I know this is a leader, when God is doing stuff that I don't expect, what is this about? The Lord said in his spirit, John, is it okay with you if I just tickle my kids? Oh gosh, yes, of course it is, God, you're, you're, you're the dad. I'm just your servant who's called the pastor. You can tickle your kids as much as you like. So that definition is really good for me. Sometimes God just wants to have a nice tickling time with us. So we relax, we stop carrying all our stuff and we just let him massage us from the inside out with a sort of internal bubble bath. After Caris was born, about six weeks later, God fell on me in a very intense, special way as well. It did, I, I've had many encounters with the Holy Spirit in my life, but this was a really special one about Mary's pain when she produced Jesus and how much I was carrying. Um, I was listening to a Graham Kendrick song called Thorns in the Straw. Some of you who are old enough might know that. And it's about the glory and the pain going together. And God was talking to me about carrying carrots. And so it started with me weeping and engaging with the pain and it ended with me laughing. So much so that Vince and Caris, who were sitting on the sofa, Caris was you know, a tiny little one, six weeks old, in Vince's arms, were looking at me like, oh, what's gone, gone on with mummy? Because mummy was lying on the floor, rolling around, laughing my socks off. I don't think I could have got through the next three and a half years of what we went through with Caris if I hadn't had quite a lot of regular doses of getting completely drunk in the Holy Spirit. Or, you know, I don't, do that very much now I do other things I know but I don't at the moment particularly but it was like God's way of giving me the kit that I needed from the, the journey you know he needed to give me that sense of him loving me caring for me relaxing me looking after me because our life was just so tense so stressful in and out of hospital for three and a half years with our precious baby holding on to God and holding on to her so that's what it did in my life. I had some really good teaching around that time from a guy called Jack Deere. He wrote some books, Surprised by the Voice of God, Surprised by the Holy Spirit, and also a series of audio cassettes about having um, dreams from God and interpreting them. If you like good Bible teaching, can I recommend Jack Deere very strongly to you? He was a conservative evangelical before the Holy Spirit really touched him. So he's got that depth of biblical knowledge. He's incredibly thorough, but he's totally inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I really, really found it helpful. And he talked about friends getting internal witnesses to the Holy Spirit. Some people would get stuff in their nose when demonic stuff was going on. Some people would get stuff in their heart. Lots of people would get sort of pins and needles and tingling in their hands and up their arms and things. And I remember thinking as I hear, heard this teaching, that sounds really cool. And then it started happening to me within that period of time. Not all at once, it's grown through the years. Um, 
It had happened dramatically when I was first baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1988. And it would happen occasionally if God was really working in power in a meeting at first. You've got to hear this carefully. I'm not showing off here. I'm trying to be analytical so that people feel comforted and clear about what is going on sometimes. Most of what I feel from the Holy Spirit doesn't show on the outside at all. God is talking to me. What I felt extremely powerfully when I was first baptized in the Holy Spirit, I now feel really easily. You know, like I get lots of tingles and specific connections with bits of my body when I mention the name Jesus, when I start to pray. You know, I don't have to be praying with my mouth. I can feel it in my body. My body changes. It's all internal. You don't see any of it. It's incredibly discreet. But it's as if God has successively over however many years it is, I've been walking with the Lord since 21, since I was 21 and I'm 57, so nearly 58. So all those years, a lot of years, I'm not going to matter. Um, God has gone deeper and deeper and deeper. So that the, as I keep saying yes, so that he is helping me just to minister in his flow rather than mine. And what I learned when I heard a really good sermon was that I'm very relaxed in working under the anointing. The anointing is to do with power to do things. In other words, I can see what God wants to do. And all I do is stick my sail in front of his wind. Yeah, that's what I do. I just do it instinctively. I can see and feel what God is wanting to do. I'm not all that clever, but I can stick my sail in front of the wind and he will blow me places. And guys, on that Friday, those of us that were here, and don't worry if you weren't, one of the things that you will notice for me is even as a little drop of the Holy Spirit gets going in a public meeting, I start bouncing around backwards. Okay, boop, 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 boop. it looks really fun. It is quite fun, but I think it's more to do with the fact of me trusting God so I don't know where I'm being taken or who I'm being taken to. He's literally physically positioning my body and it's to do with years of walking with him and trusting him that I just let him do it. And if I look a bit odd, there you go. They might think my shoe color is odd if they're going to be, you know, concerned about me. But most people who particularly come to those meetings in the evenings are just wanting more of God and they don't care what it looks like. So I tend to move under the anointing easily and freely. But there's another way that the Holy Spirit blows, which is really strongly evidenced in the way my husband works. He works powerfully under the authority. God. You know the sermon. Am I going on too long? Good. You know, you know the story about the um, centurion who sends his servant to talk to Jesus because his other servant is at home really ill. And then he comes out to Jesus himself. And Jesus says, why aren't you asking me to literally turn up at your house? Why are you just saying you can say the word, sir, and I know my servant will get well? And I've not seen faith like this, Jesus says, not in Israel. And you're not even a Jewish person. You're a Gentile. How have you got this? And he says, the centurion says something really interesting. I'm a man under authority. And if I say something, people do it. I know. It's as if he's saying, I know you're under God's authority. <laughs> I can see greater authority than mine. I know about authority. And I'm under authority. So I can wield authority. And I know what that looks like. I'm a centurion. I have to boss people about for a living. There you go. It's my day job. I know that you can do this. And Jesus goes, wow. He doesn't say it backwards. He just says, wow, the first time. Yeah. Now, Vince moves a lot like that. He said, you know, darling, sometimes I can't tell what the Holy Spirit is doing. But what I can do, and he really can, is turn up all the knobs on the cooker. Uh -huh, until everything is at boiling point. And then I can really see what the Holy Spirit is doing. Because people are flapping around on the floor like wet fishes. <laughs> Yeah, he moves in authority. In other words, he can say, Lord, I want this to happen. Can we do this together? And because he's so under Jesus's authority, it starts to happen. <laughs> so he just, he can pray for what, in a sense, he thinks is right to happen, and it starts to happen. Now, does God want Vince to hear and see and work in the anointing more? Yes. Does God want me, Cleo, to be a bit more confident in my own authority and say, in Jesus' name, be healed? Yes. We're all meant to be getting more whole in all of this. 
This is not just a Vincent Cleo party. This is all of us in the body of Christ that move like this. And actually, although I can't see one of your faces, because I'm just looking into a little telephone screen, a lot of you are getting inner witnesses as I'm saying this. Oh, yes, I get the odd tingle. I get the old bump. It won't look and feel like it is for me. It'll be uniquely tuned into you and the way you work. So when God says, well, not when it comes out in Samuel, that it says God looks at the heart, man looks at the outside, we are learning to train ourselves not to be put off by what other people are doing, but to listen and respond to what God is doing. So I find it easy to be responsive to God. Vince finds it really easy to hear, to have that sense of God's authority on him and say, Lord, I'm using my rational here. I believe these people need to pray for whatever. And I'm going to pray using my rational. And God turns up because he knows that Vince is under his authority and they're building authority together. So that is a way that it works. Now, I'm going to just quickly finish. On that Friday evening, we said we're going to minister now. there have been some good preaching. there have been some amazing worship. And we did a little bit of ministry. I went back and held Vince's hand. I think I just needed some, I don't know, sense of togetherness at that moment. And I said, what should we do now? And he said, I want to go to be with Laura and Mark. Now, I wouldn't have done that because I was just wanting to go and minister to people. But Vince wanted to go and be with his drinking buddies, basically. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was bubbling over the Holy Spirit. He wanted to be with other people who were bubbling over with the Holy Spirit. Just he had an instinct that that's what the, was the good thing to do at that point. So I went with him. Now, as soon as we connected the four of us together, not, it doesn't mean to say that the Holy Spirit wasn't doing lots of other stuff around the room. He was doing masses of stuff. But the power came on all of us, and instantly I started bouncing backwards. And I bounced off to a lady called Michelle and started praying with her. And then I moved on to Vicky. It doesn't mean to say that every time I pray for someone, I have to bounce backwards to them, by the way. But sometimes it works like that. There was an increase of the power and the release because they had four people agreeing in the spirit that we wanted God in, in as dramatic a way as he wanted to be. So Kaylee was laughing a lot. Marianne was laughing a lot. Both these ladies have been through enormous situations recently in the last few years. Incredible, horrid pain. God wanted to tickle his kids. Can we just relax and enjoy it and let them do it? And if you want to go and catch it, hang around with them. But don't judge and don't judge yourself either. Don't think, what's the matter with me? That doesn't happen to me. You just keep engaging with God. It doesn't matter what happens to them. God is wanting to touch you in your way for you so that is me coming into a close trying to be a good meteorologist and explain how wind works as i have understood it thus far in my life the point is it can't be completely understood the bible says we know in part we prophesy in part i am not trying to make this aloof or oh it's all right for them Second class, first class, there is no such thing as second or first class wisdom. All of us, all of us are just going from one degree of glory into another. But God talked to me many years ago about the fact that moving in the supernatural was like you were used to using the little Brio Lego, no, Brio wooden trains, and then he just wants to give you the electric train. Okay, it moves faster, it does more stuff, it's got bells and whistles. They're gifts from the Holy Spirit, they're not rewards for good behavior. I'm not better than somebody who doesn't move in the supernatural. It's a gift. And the, the, the things that make these things gifts are, have you been asking for this? Are you confident enough to great? The Bible says, Paul says, I wish you would all speak in tongues. You know, um, I speak in tongues more than all of you. It's just a starter gift. There's nothing wrong with eagerly desiring the greater gift. And God said, clearly, I'm trusting you with the electric train. It's fine. I wouldn't give it to you unless it was going to be good for you. Stop worrying about it. Stop thinking you're inadequate and just let me be God on this one. Okay, there was one more thing I wanted to say. Yes, okay. I was working for Scripture Union, many of you know this, for many years. And I had to talk at a sales meeting once. I was a video producer and I loved my sales team so much. We were like, oh, brothers in arms. And we would sing and worship together and we wouldn't do it the way we were supposed to do it. We had such fun. 
and the sales reps who were four gentlemen of different middle ages, but they were mostly a lot older than me. I was only in my twenties at this stage, told me this about what was happening nationally in the UK in around 93, 94, 95. They said, you know, we love the stuff that's coming from Toronto. I said, I'm good. And I said, why is that then? And they said, well, we work for IVP, InterVarsity Press, as well as Scripture Union. That's an academic publishing house. They specialize in big tomes about the Bible. They said, wherever the Holy Spirit has broken out, it's breaking out in towns like Colchester and wherever it is, Sheffield. Those are the towns that are going mad for our books. Because people just want to get into their Bibles. They want to get into the word of God as God freshens them up with his Holy Spirit. So don't let there be any division in your mind. Don't let any wrong teaching confuse you about this. The more God works in your life, the more scripture becomes alive to you. And the more hungry you get to understand more about his beautiful word and what he wants to do in this world through it. There is no, you know, oh, the charismatic, they're wafty, wavy and into emotional healing and they wave their hands and the people of the word they're the people that really know the truth about jesus word and spirit are meant to work together it's like an army marching just like social action and evangelism that's another march social action evangelism social action evangelism word spirit word spirit that's how the march goes okay <laughs> that's it that's my sermon hope you liked it